You're listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truths in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Well, good morning and welcome to our service uh, this morning. We want to bid all who are with us, uh, either uh, electronically or in-house, we want to bid you greetings and enjoy our services together as we worship our great God and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even worthy of all of the blessings I've had while living below. When I think of heaven and all of its splendor, I know I'm not worthy to go. Feebly I've tried. To do what you wanted And be what you'd have me to be But when you make up your jewels And call in your own Jesus have mercy on me Jesus have mercy on one of your children Who's failed and been far from the best Jesus have mercy on one who's unworthy And already overly blessed I've heard of the glory that awaits all the saints But that's too high to hope to be but when you look in the book and you're calling the road Jesus have mercy on me Lord I'm down here where you used to be but I failed all the tests that you passed and so i won't be first in the race but run it was all that you asked when i stand before you on that final day i'm sure that you plainly see It's not justice I'm needing But mercy, oh Lord Jesus, have mercy on me Jesus, have mercy on one of your children Who's failed and been far from the best Jesus have mercy on one who's unworthy And already overly blessed I've heard of the glory that awaits all the saints But that's too high to hope to be but when you look in the book and you're calling the road Jesus have mercy on me Jesus have mercy on me We'd 
you'd have you uh, take your Bibles, if you would, uh, initially and turn to the 11th chapter of the very first book of the Bible. Have your Bibles open at uh, the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis. It's quite interesting that we're preaching a series from the last book, but this morning we want to comment on a passage, uh, first of all, in the first book. <coughs> It's good to see the little puffs of dust uh, coming up out of the pews for those of you who don't often turn to the Old Testament. And it's good that you can blow that dust off these passages of Scripture. But I want to begin uh, this morning by saying to you, and I think most of you would probably be very, very aware of this, that humanity is incurably religious. Humanity is incurably religious. And since mankind's earliest days upon the face of the earth, people have sought in the outliving of their lives to earn God's favor through various systems of work-based salvation. And therefore, when we come to uh, the last book of the Bible, we should not be surprised that the deceptive message of a work-based religion will play a major role in the last days of planet earth and John's apocalypse the last book uh, the book of the revelation reveals that this false system of belief will actually become an essential element of antichrist's final world system as he engineers his military his political and his economical and philosophical empire and as believers today those of us who have been purchased by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Our task is to seek out any trace of falsehood. Our task is to seek out works-based righteousness in our relationship with God and replace it with the truth. That we are saved and we are sustained solely by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved and sustained solely by grace, by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 200, 2004 movie, St. Ralph, it tells the tale of a 14-year-old boy who lost his father in World War II and whose mother was lying in a coma. And this young boy, he come, becomes convinced that he can earn his mother's survival by trading one miracle for another. And upon hearing that uh, winning the Boston Marathon in the United States of America, upon hearing that, uh, he determines that that would be just such a miracle. And it becomes his quest. The warped theology of the story is easy to spot. It's easy to spot because it is so familiar to our own sin-twisted nature that one miracle deserves another. You see, we want to believe, many of us, that if we work hard enough, suffer long enough, and believe purely enough, that the Lord will have no choice but to grant us our deepest desires. The desire of mankind to achieve salvation on its own merit has deep roots in our history. And I simply say that because before languages and borders divided us, all the people of the earth lived in one community in a land called Shinar under the powerful leadership of a person or a man by the name of Nimrod, whose name means rebel. And it was evidently the, the force behind building the Tower of Babel in rebellion against God Almighty, the account of which is recorded in Genesis chapter 11, the passage that I've turned you to, and the first nine verses of which contain the first example of organized work-based false religion. Now this is how the account goes. God had intended for man to disperse over all of the earth 
But instead of dispersing over the earth as God has intended, men build a city. And a tower in this place called Shinar, better known as Babylon, and said to one another, and it's recorded in the fourth verse of that 11th chapter, follow along, see what they said. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now notice, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. It clearly was a policy of pride, you see, to make a name for themselves. It was clearly a pol policy of defiance to avoid being scattered and an effort to reach heaven by the works of their own hands. And the religious pride of Babylon and the Babylonians is well documented. Written Babylonian accounts of the building of the city of Babylon refer to its construction in heaven by the gods as a, as a celestial city. And they took great pride in their, in their buildings. They boasted, to, uh, boasted that their city was uh, not only impregnable, impregnable, but it also was a heavenly city. Babylon, the gate of God. And in the book of the Revelation, as the Apostle John writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he used Babylon to describe a particular world-oriented system and a system of thinking that was wholly opposed to God's. And we see that system in, in operation in our world today. We see it in the films that we see on the television. We hear it in the commentaries of politicians. We hear it everywhere that we go. The philosophy that pervades this world is anti-God. And words that characterize Babylon include things like pride, achievement, religiosity, and rebellion. So turn from chapter 11 in the book of Genesis now and go, if you will, to chapter 17 of the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, and zoom in on verses 1 and 2 of chapter 17 and follow along with me, if you will. And here we read, One of the seven angels who had <coughs> the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. You see, one of the angels associated with the bowl judgments invited John, the apostle who was in exile on the Isle of Patmos to witness the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now what you need to understand is this, that in Scripture, in the inerrant precious word of God, uh, prostitution frequently symbolizes idolatry and religious apostasy. And the evil woman symbolizes uh, the religious system of Babylon from which many of the world's false work-based religions come. The many waters, according to verse 15 of the passage, are the peoples, multitudes and nations and languages of the world. And the angel informed John that the kings of the earth had committed adultery with the woman, indicating very simply that all of the world leaders will be absorbed into the empire of Satan's false Christ in the end days. And the scripture says that the inhabitants of the earth, verse 2 of the passage, the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with her wine and adulteries. In other words, they had become part of the religious system she symbolized. 
verse 3 and following, if you will, says this. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert. And then I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten thorns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. You see, John uh, was taken and carried away in his spirit to the desert where he was given a better understanding of this vision. And there he saw the woman herself. She was sitting, the scripture says, on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. It's a, a little bit frightening. But the scarlet beast is an obvious reference to the world government of the Antichrist of the, of the day, of the time, the future time. And the ten horns are, are later defined in verse 12 of the chapter as ten kings who have not yet received their kingdom. And the seven heads seem to refer to prominent rulers of the yet future empire of Antichrist. Now, the woman, occur according to verse 4, was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And you see, purple and scarlet are the colors of royalty, are the colors of nobility and wealth. And the woman is portrayed as a prostitute who has plied her trade very successfully and become extremely wealthy. Now understand, prostitutes often dress in fine clothes and precious jewels. And they do that according to Proverbs 7.10 to simply lure their victims. And the religious harlot, Babylon, is no different. Adorning herself uh, to lure the nations into her grasp into a false religious system. Now, I have been preaching now for 40 plus years, 45 years, I think. And it's very, very interesting. I've made some interesting observations, but it's very, very interesting to me that her adornment is very, very similar to that of the religious trappings of the many ritual, ritualistic churches of the day, many of whom prostitute the truth, who deny the deity of Christ, who deny that Jesus was God in the flesh, who do deny the substitutionary work of the cross, who deny the resurrection of Jesus, and put forward and proffer a religion of works-based salvation. And in her hand, the woman held a golden cup filled with abominable things and filled and the filth of her adulteries. This is still another evidence of her wealth. But the pure gold is defiled by the filthiness of her immorality. And you see, church, just as a prostitute might first get her victim drunk, so the harlot religious system deceives the nations into committing spiritual fornication with her and is confirmed by the words written on her forehead. Look at that, verse 5. Mystery, Babylon the mist, the great, the mother of prostitutes 
and of the abominations of the earth. Let me un have you understand this. That all false religion, all false work-based religion, stems ultimately from Babel or Babylon. Verse 6 goes on to say, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. That's the believers. Tribulation believers. The blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. He says, I saw her, I was greatly astonished. You see, the woman symbolizing the apostate religious system was drunk with the blood of the tribulation believers. And I don't know whether you've realized that or whether it's twigged in your mind, but this makes it clear that the apostate religious system leading up to the second coming of Christ will be devoid of any true Christians. As a matter of fact, the, the apostate church will attempt to kill all those who follow the true, the true faith. And John expressed his great astonishment at this revelation. He, and as he stood in utter amazement at the per pervasive influence of the harlot, an angel explained the vision's bizarre imagery. And we read this in verse 7 and following. Follow along. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom, or with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also hills are often referred to as countries in the prophetic scripture. There are also seven kings. Now listen carefully. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he comes, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. That's for a short time. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority, the scripture says, to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. So without going over ground that we've already covered today, let me take some key phrases and images and make a brief comment. The many waters mentioned in verse 1 and again in verse 15 represent all the people and people groups around the world. The beast mentioned in the passage is the Antichrist. And the, seven, and the mention of the seven heads and seven kings in verses 3, 7, and then again in 9, verses 9 and 10 represent seven world empires. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and that of the Antichrist. And the scripture says in the latter part of the 10th verse that five of those kingdoms have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. Now, let me show you something very interesting. When John wrote this down under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, 
the Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, and Greek empires. Five have fallen. They have gone out of existence. Rome still existed. And the Antichrist Empire had not yet come. And when it does, I tell you, history authenticates the book of the Revelation. And when it does come, it will be brief, the Antichrist kingdom, and it will end in destruction. Verse 11 says, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. You see, the Antichrist kingdom is said to be both the seventh and eighth kingdoms. This is because, you see, and we covered it in previous messages, this is because, you see, he will either fake his own death and resurrection or he will do so by the power of Satan in order to amaze the world and win its allegiance. A reference to the ten horns in verses 3, 7, and 12 are ten nations. Are ten nations who will unite to empower the Antichrist and as yet cannot presently be identified with any historical figures. I happen to believe that they will come out of the European Union, but they haven't as yet been identified, those ten nations. And verses 13 and 14 tell us, follow along, they have one purpose. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. And they will make war against the Lamb, that's Jesus. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. You see, the great harlot mentioned in verses 1 through 8 is a work-based religiosity called the mother of harlots because it is the foundation of all false religions drawing its inspiration from pride, an illusion of self-sufficiency, and a denial of God's grace. And as this particular vision concludes, the Lord reveals an unexpected twist. You see it in verse 16, 17, and 18. Look at this. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. That's a religious system. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. With poetic irony, the Antichrist, listen, will turn on the false one world religious system that he helped to formalize and he will destroy it. He will eliminate any form of religion that does not hold himself as the sole object of worship. But even this supreme act of treachery against mankind and rebellion against God will serve to achieve the Lord's ultimate plan. Listen to me carefully. God is always in control. Say it with me. God is always in control. Say it one more time. God is always in control. 
Now, a study of Revelation 17 and workspace religion prepares us, as we wrap our thoughts up for today or this morning, prepares us to reflect on three important principles. Here's the first. Religious activity feels full and alive, but is in truth empty and dead. Let me give that to you again. Religious activity feels full and alive, but is in truth empty and dead. And struggling with the purpose behind religious activity is a normal part of genuine spiritual life in Christ. And whilst believers become new creatures upon salvation, and that's the truth of the word of God, we do not automatically and immediately start living by the grace that saved us. Grace that we received out of God's, listen to me, out of God's unconditional love and neither earned nor deserved. And as we grow, the truth is we often revert to our old self-sufficient, prideful ways. Seeking to earn God's favor on our own, only to find that what we need is Christ and we need him as much as ever. Secondly, satanic strategy appears impressive and effective, but is in truth impotent and deceptive. Satanic strategy appears impressive and effective, but is in truth impotent and deceptive. You see, Satan, the father of lies, along with his host of demons, has encouraged man in his pursuit of eternal life by means of human effort. He deceives mankind through the lie of self-reliance, seeking to earn God's favor on one's own effort or through self-condemnation, the lie that one cannot be loved by God. However, let me say this to you, God's offer of salvation solely by grace through faith alone immediately cuts Satan's strategy off at the pass. But God so loved the world. God so loved you and me. He did it without a cause. He couldn't find a cause to love us, but he loved us just the same, and he gave his son. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Thirdly, God's sovereignty seems absent and uninvolved, but is in truth present and active. God's sovereignty seems absent and uninvolved, but is in truth present and active. And I say that simply because a common experience among believers, even the most mature of believers, is the feeling that the Lord remains aloof while evil runs unchecked, while evil runs amok. And it is during these times that we must avoid taking up religious activity in order to earn the Lord's favor. Because let me tell you, it is nothing more than works-based religion. No better than building a tower to heaven in our own lounge room. Nothing we can do, listen to me carefully, nothing we can ever gain let me stress that again, nothing we do will ever gain more grace than God already delights to give. And nothing will earn us more favor than his son has already earned for us on the cross. Nothing. So church, when tempted to work, submit. When troubled with doubt, 
read his word. When afflicted by hopelessness, pray that the Lord will allow you to experience the grace that he has already given you. And then do what doesn't come naturally. Wait. Because those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Amen? And amen. I want you to reflect upon the words of our closing song, whether you happen to be in-house or on the net. Rejoice. Once I lived a life so sad and lonely I really didn't have a friend to care One day I found Jesus as my Savior He changed my life completely then and there Now I have this one to whom I turn to When storms of life around me rise and swirl So I love him dearly more dearly than the spoken word can tell I've seen the beauties this world has to offer I've seen the mountains reaching for the skies But one day I saw Jesus in a vision Sweet love for me was burning in his eyes And then I cried, Lord Jesus, please forgive me a voice then softly whispered all his words And so I love him dearly I'm more dearly than the spoken word can tell Smile and say I'm doing mighty fine I know there will be some who surely doubt me But doubting me don't bother peace of mind I tell them all how Jesus really saved me I tell them how he saved me There's ringing in my heart a joy bell So I love him dearly I'm more dearly than the spoken condition of <clears throat> every heart in this place or every heart in the hearing of my voice but if you never come to a place in your life if you are relying on something you do in order to get to heaven if you're relying on a work uh, can I suggest to you that in terms of the scripture you would be lost The fact is, the truth of the matter is that we are sinners. We are unholy. We have offended a holy God. We have broken his law. And when we break his law at just one point, we stand condemned. That's why Jesus came. He came to this planet to take our place on a cruel, rugged Roman cross. And God laid on him all of our iniquities, all of our sins. But if you're relying on something you do to get you into heaven, today needs to be the day that you bow before a holy God. Say, Lord, I have fallen short of your glory. Forgive me. I trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I'm not going to ask you to walk an aisle 
I'm not going to ask you to get up off your couch in the lounge room at home. I'm simply only going to ask you to consider where you stand before a holy God and ensure your destiny by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, this morning we want to thank you for the joy and the privilege of having been able to worship together. Bring us back to this place tonight as we meet around the Lord's table. I pray, Father, that we might reflect again on the all-sufficient work of the cross. Our heart's desire in this place is that you get all the praise and all of the honour and all of the glory. And we pray that you would use your word in a wonderful way to bring people into the kingdom as it works in conjunction with the effectual working power of your spirit. We ask that for your glory and we ask that you dismiss us with your grace from this place this morning. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org Until next time, God bless.